So um, Max is a um, coffee freak and a licensed ski instructor from Austria, of course. Of course. You know, the only country that delivers licensed ski instructors on a daily basis. He is the creator of Keystone.js and lots of other open source projects. He runs an awesome React related newsletter, I noticed on your website. And he's going to talk to us about component based styling in React, which is clearly an acute problem without any clear winning solution yet. So as the author of the styled component, components project, Max is a thought leader in this field and he's going to tell you all about his insights. Please give it up, a warm welcome for Max Stoiber. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I start, I just want to mention how freaking amazing this venue is. I mean, we're in a shipyard. How cool is that? Um, as he said, my name is Max. Welcome to React Amsterdam. I am, as he also said, from Austria, specifically from Vienna. And what you see in the background there on my slide is a very faint picture of Vienna. Um, I'm the co-founder of a small startup called Space Program. And we make an app called Spectrum, which is not released yet. But it's a platform for large-scale communities to live on. And we're really excited to see where it goes. Over the past two years, I've been thinking about this component thing, right? Because right now, we're in this component age, right? We're in this age where everybody's building interactive user interfaces based on components, right? We're no longer structuring documents. We're structuring everything in tiny reusable pieces. Um, and that started when we got really into JavaScript, right? And we invented these methodologies to make everything work in a component-based manner, right? Like BIM, like Smack CSS, like, you know, a bunch of these methodologies that just make everything work as a component because it's really, really, really nice to use, right? Working in components is an extremely nice way of building user interfaces, right? It makes sense. You have tiny reusable Lego blocks that you just plug together to build your really complex interactive application. And by understanding the small pieces, you can understand the big picture, and that's it, right? You just, there's no unknowns, unknowns going anymore, right? You don't have thousands of lines of templates. You just have your tiny components that you plug together. As we've built more and more things with components, we've also discovered some best practices around that, right? One of them is to have small and focused components, and the other one is to split containers and components, right? With small focus components, I mean that you have encapsulated Lego blocks, right? So if you think about it, right, if you have a button component, you might in React have something like this, right, where you have a button component that has a class name of button. And then if you want to have a bigger, more important button, you attach a class name like button dash dash primary if you're using the BEM notation, right? And you might have all seen code like this. But if you think about it in React, these class names are an implementation detail, right? Because we have components, the users of our components don't need to be aware of specifically which class name they need to attach to the DOM to render something in the way they want, right? Because we have components, we can encapsulate these class names within our components and abstract them in an API like this, right? We can just have a button component that just renders a button. Right? And we can have a primary property that does something, but it makes the button primary. It makes it bigger. Right? And there's a contract between you, the developer, and the component that you're using, which is the properties, right? where whoever wrote that component can say, hey, if you pass the primary prop, that will make it more important. Right? But what specifically makes it more important, what specifically changes, you shouldn't have to care about it. Right? You just want to put a more important button there. It doesn't matter what it does. It should just be consistent across your entire interface. Right? So this gives us a lot of very nice benefits. By encapsulating these tiny Lego blocks with their own behavior, we don't even have to understand the small pieces to build something with it, right? I don't have to know how exactly my button works, right? I don't have to know what exactly the primary property does, right? I don't have to know exactly what the disabled, button does, uh, the dis the disabled property does with my button. I don't need to know that. I can just make a disabled button, and it'll work the same across my entire application. I don't care what specifically that does unless I'm building a button, right? But if I'm structuring my whole interface now, 
I don't need to think about it, right? I just render a button, or a primary button, or a disabled button. That gives us a lot of nice benefits, like code reuse, right? And I can compose multiple components together, and I can understand everything. And it just works really nicely, right? I like building things in components. I like components. The second best practice I mentioned is splitting containers and components, right? Um, container components and smaller components it's an abstract concept that was introduced a while ago, and that's especially prevalent in the React ecosystem. So if we have, for example, a sidebar component here, this sidebar component doesn't do much, right? I mean, the component mounts, it fetches some data, and then when that data has been fetched, it renders it out, it, it renders it out to the DOM as a sidebar. Now, this is sort of muddles two things together, right? On the one hand, this component does data fetching and data management, but on the other hand, it also cares about how things look, right? It, does styling because it has class names. But the thing is, if you build containers and components, you want to have containers that care about how things work and components that care about how things look. So you might structure your sidebar like this, right? Now, that was a tiny change, right? The only thing we did was we renamed it to sidebar container, and rather than rendering a div, we now render a sidebar component and a sidebar item component, right? And that might seem like a small difference, but it actually makes a huge difference in how you can find bugs in your application, because if you think about it, right, bugs in your application probably exist on two levels. One is logic, right? Some data fetching didn't work, some data has the wrong format, something, some prop isn't passed through, and the other bug you have is styling related, right? Where suddenly your layout shifts and it looks completely wrong. You have one column rather than two, and there's something is too big, something is too small, something is the wrong color, right? And by structuring your application in containers and components, it is, it is really, really clear where to find the bug. Because I can look in my React DevTools and I can see, hey, the sidebar component, it got the right properties, right? It fetched the right data and the state is correct, but the styling is off. So something's wrong with my sidebar com component and not with the sidebar container. On the other hand, if I look at the state of my sidebar container and I see, hey, the data that came back, that doesn't look right. Like something's obviously wrong there. I can go into my sidebar container and fix the data management, right? And as a developer, for me, that makes it much easier to track down where exactly bugs happen, right? Because I can see, I know where things happen. So the short summary of that is containers are how things work and components are how things look. Right? And if you keep that in mind in your application, you'll already gain a lot of understanding in what happens and where the bugs are. Now, I've mentioned styling a bunch of times, right? But what about styling and component-based systems, right? As we've styled more and more and more of these user interfaces based on components, we've also discovered some best practices around that. One of them is single-use classes, and the other one is using components as a styling construct. Now, single-use classes, oops, sorry, single-use classes means if you have a button class name, right, you would not reuse that class name anywhere except for inside of your button component, right? Why would you? If you have a button class name that makes a button and you reuse that button component throughout your entire application, why would you ever use that class name anywhere else? Right? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to give your header a button class name. It doesn't make sense to give your card a button class name, right? Only the button has a button class name. That's the whole point. Right? And as, if you keep to that principle of only ever using every class once, it makes it really easy to figure out where your styling bugs come from. Because suddenly, if your button looks wrong, you just look at the button class name. Right? Where else would you look? There is no other class name to go to. If your header looks wrong, you look at the header class name. If your footer looks wrong, you look at the footer class name. Right? And so on and so forth. It's really easy to figure out where the bug comes from. Whereas if you use the same class, like if you use the button class again on your header because it has the right background or something, and then another developer comes in and changes the background of the button, and suddenly the header changes background, and the developer is like, what? What is going on here? What's happening? Right? And it's really confusing. The second thing is using components as a styling construct. And this is sort of a bit of a weird concept still, but because we have components in React, we can use them to style our, our application. Right? We don't need to have specific class names, like a grid class name, Rather than having a grid class name, I can have a grid component, right? And by having a grid component that I reuse throughout my entire application, I make sure that it's consistent all the time. My users don't need to be aware of which specific class names they need to use. They just pass a property, right? And that way, I can use components as a styling construct. And then when I build a component, I look at it. I know how it works. 
and also a bit of what the layout is, right? Because I see a grid component and I see a column component. I already know, okay, this component will have two columns with some data here and some data, like some items there, and it's very nice to work with. A good friend of mine, Michael Chan, wrote an article about this concept of components as a styling construct, and in that article, he had this great quote, which is, if you're writing React, you have access to a more powerful styling construct than CSS class names. You have components. And that is the crux of why the React community and many of my friends, we've been moving towards putting the styles into JavaScript because we have JavaScript, right? We have the full power of JavaScript. Why shouldn't we use it for styling as well, right? There's no reason to be limited by another language. We, can, we have that power of the components and of JavaScript, and I want to leverage that with my styling as well. Now, the issue with best practices is always enforcing them, right? Because best practices are great, right? You can write articles about them and, you know, it's awesome and everybody loves them. But then when you're actually in the nitty gritty details of your app, it's a different story, right? Because you have a deadline. You have a boss that's sitting on your back saying, hey, you have to get that done by tomorrow, right? And then best practices, I don't give a shit, right? I need to get that done by tomorrow, right? So we need to somehow enforce best practices. And we, me and Glenn Mattern, came up with a solution that is style components. Now, most people, when they, if you know style components or if they first see style components, they don't quite realize the benefits it gives you. So style components is a library made by myself and Glenn Mattern. Um, you might know Glenn from CSS modules. He was also one of the co-creators of CSS modules. And the important thing about style components, the important thing that we did is we removed the mapping between styles and components, right? Because if you think about it, if you only ever use every class name once, why do you have a class name at all, right? There's no reason to have a class name if you only use it once. Because a class name fundamentally is a mapping between a piece of styling, right? You have a piece of styling inside of your class name and a DOM node. Right? And that class name is the mapping between this piece of styling and a DOM node. But if I only ever use that mapping once, why do I have a mapping at all? I don't, I don't need to have that, right? So this is what style components looks like. The first thing we do is we import style from style components. Nothing fancy going on here, but then it starts getting weird because we say const title equals styled.h1 and then a backtick. And this style.h1 thing is a function, right? It's a function that, when called, returns a React component that renders an h1 tag to DOM, right? So our title variable here, notice how it's uppercased, is now a React component that renders an h1 HTML tag to the DOM, right? That, we're all good so far. And then we do this backtick thing and pass in some styling. Now, the backticks are actually a JavaScript feature. This is not some random syntax that we invented. This is an ES6 feature. It's called a tagged template literal. So you know how you can call functions with parentheses, right, the round things? You can now also call functions with backticks. Kind of weird. Um, there is a difference in how you get the arguments when you use it as a tagged template literal. And you can look them up on MDM if you want to. But essentially, what we're doing here is we're calling style.h1 as a function with this string of CSS passed in as an argument. And our title component now is a React component that renders an h1 HTML tag with this style applied. So with a font size of 1.5 AM, which is aligned to the center and has a color of pale violet red, right? The same thing for our second component here, right? Our wrapper is, will render an HTML tag section with Again, the style is applied, right? A color of pale violet red, the padding of 4AM, it will be width and height 100%, and it will have a background of papaya wave. Now, these, this title variable and this wrapper variable, they're React components, right? And you can use them like any other React component, right? There's nothing special about them. You can just render a wrapper and a title, right? And we say, hello world, this is my first style component. And when we look at this in the browser, what you get is a section that has a papaya wave background and is width 100% and height 100%. And an H1 that has a color of pale violet red and is aligned in the center, right? Makes sense because we told style components to create an H1 that is aligned in the center and has a color of pale violet red, right? There's, it's just CSS, right? And we're not doing anything fancy here. We're just rendering an H1 in the, in the section, right? There's nothing special going on here. Now, 
One weird thing that you might have noticed is that styled components let you write actual CSS in JavaScript. Um, and that means literal CSS, right? Um, this is not inline styles. What we're doing is we're taking that string of CSS, compiling it, and then putting it into the head of the DOM in a style tag, which means you can use all of CSS inside of your styled components, right? You can have media queries, you can have nesting, you can have any, like anything you can think of in CSS, it, it's the same in styled components, right? It's the exact same. So here we have a color changer component, which has a background of PyWeb, and again, any H2s within that component will have a color of pale violet red. Now, but we have a media query as well, right? So if we get over a certain min width, we, it changes its background to medium sea green, and any H2 within gets a color of papaya whip. If you look at this in the browser, we can resize this, and it changes its color. Extremely fancy, I know. It's a CSS media query, right? Mind blown. CSS media queries, awesome. But the point is, styled components let you write actual CSS, right? You're not writing some sort of pseudo CSS. We're not doing anything fancy with JavaScript. It's just CSS that you're writing, except you can, you can also use the power of JavaScript. If you remember the first example I showed you of an, exam, of an encapsulated component, it was a button, right? And that button had a primary property. So we could adapt components based on the properties that we pass to them. And we still want to do that when we use styled components, right? I still want to be able to render a primary button, right? So again, this is what it looks like. You know, you've seen this before. It's just a button and a button with a primary property, right? So how do we make the primary prop look different with styled components? Well, because we have tag template literals, we can let you interpolate functions, right? So what I'm doing here is, I'm interpolating a function into my styles, and I'm saying, which gets past the properties of the components, right? And I'm basically saying, the background of my button should be pale violet red if the primary property is set, and white if it isn't set, and the color should be the exact inverted, right? If the primary property is set, it should be white. If it isn't set, it should be pale violet red. Now, this works because we have tag template literals. If you were to do this with a normal string, what you would get out is a literal string saying function, yada, 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 right? That's not what we want. But with tag template literals, style components has access to the actual functions, and we can run them and pass in the properties of your component, which means we can render a primary button just like this, right? There's nothing fancy going on. You can literally render a primary button like this. And when you look at it in the browser, you get a normal button, and you get a primary button, right? It's, that's it. That's how you adapt based on properties. And it, this is so powerful because we now can pass in things like the width, the height. We can do server-side rendering. There's so many possibilities here to, when you have this ability to pass in any JavaScript value into your styling. Now, we have these tiny encapsulated components, right? And that's great and all, and they're, you know, Lego blocks, and you can build your user interface, and yada, yada. But one issue that we found is that we wanted, still wanted to have some global themes. Right? I still want to be able to say, hey, my brand color is this kind of blue. And I don't want to have to write that color everywhere because I'm pretty sure I'll make a mistake. Right? I just want to use the same color all across my application. So Style Components has theming built right into the library. Right? This is what it looks like. We export this theme provider component that you can then import. And you can define your theme as an object. Right? So you say, hey, I want my primary color to be pale violet red. And then you just wrap your entire app in this theme provider, kind of like the, React, uh, the, the Redux provider thing, right? Except ours is a theme provider, not a store provider. Um, and then in your style components, you can adapt them based on the theme, right? So in our button, we again interpolate a function and have this props.theme variable, which, re which is basically whatever theme this button is rendered into. So here we're basically saying the background of our button should be whatever the primary theme color is of the section that it's rendered in. Now, if we just render this one button, it'll have a background of pale violet red, right? But the thing about this theme provider is that you can have as many of them as you want, right? So for example, I could have a red green theme and I could have a green theme, right? And the, pale, the, the, the primary color of the red theme is pale violet red, but the primary color of the green theme is medium sea green. And then I can render two theme providers within the same application, 
right? So I can say, hey, my main area, I want to have the red theme of that, right? The main area should have a red theme, and the sidebar should have the, should have the green theme, right? I want that to look slightly differently. And the thing is, you don't need to change your components in the sidebar, right? You do not need to do anything with your components in the different theme provider. What you see here is, both buttons are rendered the exact same way, right? I don't change anything about the button. I don't pass any properties. I don't do anything. Just depending on the context that they're rendered in, just depending on the area that they are rendered in, that button will adapt to the theme. So I can have as many buttons as I want, and if I render them in a red area, they'll be red. If I render them in a green area, they'll be green, right? And I don't need to think about it. I don't have anything to think about because my button will just use the primary theme color. And if the sidebar has a theme of green, great. If the main area has a green of, uh, theme of red, great. The button will just adapt based on the context that it's in. This theme provider works as many levels of components deep as you want, right? So you can have as many DOM nodes and components and whatever you want between your theme provider and your styled components. That button will still get that theme, right? Because we use React's context feature, we can do that. When we finished the first prototype of styled components almost, I don't know, eight months ago, um, we started working with it, right? Because we built the library and it didn't look like styled components looks now. It was way different because it was a first prototype, but we just started using it, right? And as we used it, we iterated on the API, we changed some things, and we continued evolving it into what it eventually became, right? And as I was building an application, a web application with styled components, I was like, this is awesome. Like, this just feels great to work with. I actually, I really enjoy styling my app now. Like, this is kind of nice. And then I had to go work on a React Native app, and I had to go back to the normal way of styling. And I was like, I kind of just want to use styled components from my React Native apps as well, right? Why, why can I not do that? So Glenn and I built full React Native support into styled components, right? The only thing you have to do differently is you have to import style from style-component slash native which gives you access to the native primitives, right? If you haven't used React Native before, on, a, on the web, we have divs, and we have p's, and we have h1s, right? On React Native, we don't have divs. We have views, and texts, and images, right? They're slightly different primitives. And by importing from style-component slash native, you get access to those primitives. So our wrapper is a style.view, which is kind of like a div on the web. And again, we pass in some styles, right? Again, the background color is Papaya Whip, and we say flex one and justify content center, align item center, so everything is sort of you know, centered in our app. And then our title is a style.text, right? Again, a React Native primitive. And again, we pass in some styles. The font size should be 20, the text size should be aligned in the center, the margin should be 10, yada, yada, yada. But, and these are, again, just normal React Native components, so you can render them in your React Native app like any other component, right? And when you look at this in your React Native app, it, it's a Papaya with background and a pale violet red text, right? It's the exact same thing except with the React Native primitives. This is an, the screenshot that you see there is my actual phone. This, this like when, when we first got this working and I ran this code and it actually compiled and worked, I looked at it and I went, holy cow, this is awesome. Right? And I immediately took this screenshot. I've been using the same screenshot ever since. I've, been built, I've built much more complex things, but I just, it's the first, like you can see, it was 6023 when we first built that. Good to know, right? Anyway, um, now I could stand here all day long and, well, I couldn't, but I could physically stand here all day long and talk to you about how awesome Style Components is. But now that it's been, now that it's been out for six months, I have the help of some other people, right? For example, Sebastian McKenzie, who, whom you might know and recognize as one of the creators of Babel, who recently tweeted that I fucking love style components. So good. Thank you so much for making my life easier, right? And then there is um, Griffin, who works at Reddit, and who basically tweeted, I cannot say enough good things about style components, right? There is Pablo, who tweeted, using style components is so pleasant that I migrated some SAS to it as a therapeutic exercise. It felt good. Now, I'm not a doctor, right? I don't want to advocate this as stress relief therapy. But I mean, if you have an existing, it might be worth trying if you're stressed out, right? Just to migrate some SAS, and apparently, it's a therapeutic exercise. Just saying, worth trying. And there is a bunch of other people who tweet nice things about it and who use it. Um, it's the thing about style components if there's only one thing you remember of this talk, 
It's that I love styled components, right? Not because I made it, but because when I use it, I feel like I don't ever want to use anything else. I tried it. I tried it when we finished the first real thing that had that API, and I went, yeah, that's it. I don't ever want to build my apps a different way again, right? And I'm telling you this because I want you to try it, right? It looks really weird. It has some really weird ideas. It's an extremely, I mean, just look at it. It just looks weird, right? I, I, I felt the same way. But using it just feels amazing. And that's why I'm standing here, because I want you to feel the same way, right? Now, to install style components, you do it like any other NPM library, right? You say NPM install style. Wait, no, that's wrong. Yarn adds styled components um, to install it in your application. We're also on GitHub, so if you go to github.com slash styled components slash styled components, you'll find the repo. Please submit pull requests, issues, let us know what you think. You know, we're very open to any comments, any, any improvements you see. Try it, let, let me know how it goes. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. Thank you very much for this great talk on st styling React components. I think it's the future, um, and your take looks wonderful. Thank you. I think we have a little bit of time for some questions. Um, I'm wondering if there's any volunteers willing to help me to run the mic. OK, great. Any questions for Max? Don't be shy. I don't bite. Over there. Sometimes. Along, along the aisle. Hey. Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, can you briefly explain how it works uh, inside, basically? What you do uh, in the implementation? So, yes. Um, let me show you the slide again with the code. Um, so looking at this. What we do under the hood is we take your CSS, right? We take this CSS, and we have to parse it because there is no selector, right? If we just took that string and injected it into the DOM, it wouldn't be valid, right? The, the, the browser would say, what are you trying to do? So we parse that CSS, and we execute all of the functions. Um, let me see if I can find an interpolation somewhere. And we execute all of your interpolations, and then we compute a random class name and inject that into the DOM and, and attach it to the component under, and to the DOM node underneath. Um, the biggest thing we do is actually using tag template literals because when you use tag template literals, you get... So if you look at this, right, what we get in styled components is an array of every string, but also an array of every interpolation as a separate thing, right? So we have to flatten them out. We have to put them back together in the right order, and then we have to execute the functions. Um, I would say look at the code base. Um, we use Flow, so everything's documented fairly well. Um, if you have any questions just, you know, about the code base, just find me on Twitter. Thank you. Any more questions? Run, 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 run. Hey, thank you for the talk. Sure. Uh, the question is, uh, would you recommend to use such an approach for more complex components? Say, you don't have just a button or a div, uh, rather than um, more complex structure inside. Is that approach good here? That is a good question. Um, these are all very simple examples, right? My button isn't just a single DOM node, right? My button is sometimes a React router link. My button is sometimes an anchor tag. My button is sometimes a button tag. Right? And the thing is, I don't build my button out of one single DOM node, but the DOM nodes inside of those bigger components are still styled components, right? If you think about your big component, you write div class name button, and then you might write button class name inner button or whatever, right? This is a bad example because it's not very semantic, but you know what I mean, right? Bigger components have lots of DOM nodes. And I just make every single one of those class names a styled component, right? So my, comp my bigger components consist of many, many smaller styled components, and I just have styled components for everything. Um, the examples I showed you was, were, were just because I, you know, the slides aren't very big, and if I show you 50 lines of code, you'd start sleeping. But, um, so yeah, totally. I mean, we, we use it, in, lots of people use it in production now. You just, 
Think about it in the way that you build the tiny DOM nodes. If, if whatever you say div class name equals something or div style equals something, you would just have a styled component instead. So yeah. styled components Does help with structuring, right? Sorry? Styled components help with structuring. In what sense? I don't understand uh, the question. Well, in the sense that you can use uh, many small components and style them and uh, build the bigger one using those small blocks. Yes. OK. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. We have a little bit time left for a few more questions. Here one, in the front, I, I also noticed one. Just go. How do you implement server-side rendering? The question was, how do we implement server-side rendering? Um, yeah. Styled components at the moment does not have an explicit API for server-side rendering. For the simple reason that we needed to get the, like, we built this thing, right? We built this library that I thought, you know, feels really good to use. And Glenn thought feels really good to use. But we had no idea if people liked it, right? Um, so we didn't build an explicit server-side rendering API at the time. But now that a lot of people are using it and everybody's loving it, um, the next version, which is coming out, I want to say in, at the very latest two weeks, so really, really, really soon, does have an explicit server-side rendering API so you can get the string of CSS on the server. Um, we, we've built server-side rendering support in the way that it only ever injects the styles that you actually use. So you're only shipping critical CSS to your user. You're not shipping any unnecessary styles, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so that's coming really, really, really soon. Thank you, thank you. One more question. Hey, is there going to be any stylus um, support? Stylus support? Yeah, I don't like writing those uh, double dots and stuff. Um, in general, if you think about what you use from a CSS preprocessor, right? If you think about the features you use from SAS or from Stylus or from any of these preprocessors, pre JavaScript already has most of them, right? Mixins are just functions, right? Variables are just variables, right? Most of the things you would use from a CSS preprocessor already exist in JavaScript, right? Why do we need to add some arbitrary syntax if we already have JavaScript? In fact, um, I have this example that I didn't show. Give me a second. Man, this animation is slow. Um, at the very end, we're uh, too many slides. This is a mixing, right? This is, in this case, a SAS mixing. Um, and the question I get asked very often is just like you, how do I build that with like, what do I do in style components, right? But the thing is, actually, this is just a function, right? I can just turn it into a function, right? This is just turn it from a mixing into a function. And then this property thing is just a return, right? So I can just return a property. And then the desaturate and the lighten thing are a bit hard because JavaScript doesn't have a desaturate function and JavaScript doesn't have a lighten function. Right? You can't, that doesn't exist in JavaScript. So we built a tool for that, which is called Polished. Um, you can npm install it, and with Polished, you have, it follows kind of the SAS API. So if you know SAS, you know Polished. Um, and Polished sort of is the last missing gap between JavaScript and CSS preprocessors. And with Polished, we've like closed that gap, and you now have all the features of a CSS preprocessor you used to just inside of JavaScript. Thank you, thank you. Well, that was a great talk, Max. Thank you very much. Give a warm round of applause to Max.